So do we want to do some introductions since I think a lot of people on here may not know everyone? Um, I was going to introduce everybody that's presenting. Um, gotcha. You want to introduce folks on your end before we do that? Yeah, I think I, it may be easier if I do it just based on the name list um, real quick. Um, so, of course, I'm Kevin Martin. Um, I'm over the, the, the CAG group and the Division of Highway Design. And with me, I've got Aaron McCown. Uh, I'll just go in order here, shoot, with KYTC people. This is easy. So we've got Aaron McCown, who works for me and CAD. Adam Ulrich, who is kind of going between location and his role in District 5 design. Um, Alex Smith is over the technical support branch, so he works hand-in-hand -hand with the CAD group. Uh, Corinne, that's Corey. She uh, works for me and CAD as well. Erica works for me and CAD. Jared Stanley is over our research group, um, innovation stuff for out of the State Highway Engineer's Office. Jill Asher is our Director of Highway Design. Uh, John Suddeth or Sudsy is one of our surveyors, uh, our survey uh, coordinators. Um, Ken Sperry has mic problems, um, uh, among other problems, but Ken is... Ask him to talk. And what is your official title now? Because I know you were brought back for special projects and basically whatever nobody else wanted to deal with. I don't know if he can talk or not. But Ken came up through the CAD group years ago and has, you know, been with the cabinet on and off for many years. So he's really experienced in this sort of thing. Uh, Kevin Sandifer's on here. He's another one of our location engineers in highway design. Um, Matt Lawson. Is that Matt Lawson? Are Matt Lawson? Is he on in planning now with you? Yeah, he's, he's with me now. Yeah, he started out in the highway design as an EIT, and it wasn't long before we started this COVID stuff working for home. So he, it's kind of like he wasn't very, very long. Now he's in the division of planning. Uh, got Rachel Catchings, who's here from our research group at UK, um, and she's actually leading the efforts on a research project for us for um, digital models for construction. So she's going to be very interested in this. Steve DeWitt from our planning group as well. They've been looking at concept station. And then Tracy Lovell, uh, T. Love, my bourbon brother here with Jared, he's a branch manager over the Louisville um, Project Development Office. And Wendy! Last but definitely not least, Wendy Southworth is also a location engineer out of Division of Highway Design. And Troy might as well be working for the CAD. I don't know, Troy, where you're working now. You've been, I don't know. It depends on the month. And I've tried yeah, everything, exactly. so I guess I'll stay at Lochner for a while. <laughs> All right, I won't, I, won't, I won't introduce you then. I think that's it for us. I don't see John Moore on here. Jennifer Gatewood just popped in. She works for Alex. Um, it's one of our project-wise administrators in the technical support branch. And so. Okay, Kevin, thank you for uh, uh, in, inviting us on today for organizing the meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm Lochner's Lexington office manager. I'm probably the guy on the call that knows the least uh, about this stuff. Uh, but I do know uh, the powerful products that come out of it. And I'm really excited uh, uh, with what I see and what's possible. And I think it's the direction of the future, uh, whether we're ready for it or not. Uh, if this is the direction things are going. Um, I want to introduce uh, some of the folks that are going to be on the call today. Uh, Terry Walters is, is Lochner's lead for model-based design and delivery. Uh, technically, Kevin, he's out of uh, the Tampa office, but he has a uh, camper and is pretty mobile and uh, managed to stay connected wherever he is. So he uh, visits a lot of our different offices as he, depending on who he's working with. Uh, we really appreciate George Lutz from Utah DOT uh, joining us on the call today. Uh, George uh, is UDOT's digital, leads leads their digital delivery of model-based design and construction implementation. And he's uh, delivered at least 12 uh, projects with the model as the legal document, uh, with more in the pipeline. Uh, that's at least the latest according to LinkedIn, uh, George. So, uh, and then uh, John Hieronymus here in our Lexington office, is uh, our national lead for 3D visualization. I think you'll see why here in a little bit. Uh, and then uh, Troy Woodyard, uh, it, it also in Lexington, uh, brings his model-based design experience uh, uh, to the team and has been um, uh, working with Women RT. He's gonna talk a little bit about that today. And Tyler Mills as well, uh, uh, 
with a lot of experience in 3D modeling. And um, he's really picked up some Adobe After Effects that really added the final product. So we're hoping that, that uh, today's presentation gives you guys a little more comfort as you prepare for your transition uh, uh, deeper into model-based design, uh, however you envision that, and that you're comfortable with these concepts and tools uh, moving forward. So uh, again, we really appreciate the opportunity to share with you. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Terry. All right, let me share my screen. I'm just going to do the whole screen a little easier. Okay, so let me do some housekeeping here. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yep. All right, cool. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so I, I'm here to talk to you about sort of the state of the industry, and I'll probably call upon George from time to time uh, to set the record straight and such. Um, I talk about this all the time, and if you feel like you have a question, please don't don't hesitate to interrupt me. It doesn't throw me off because this isn't scripted. I just kind of, I have a few slides and I want to talk about some things, but it can be free form as well. Yeah, Terry, um, and I'm just going to throw in, it's the same thing for me. Whenever I do these, it's kind of free scripted too. And the one thing I find is, and I don't know, Terry, if you found the same thing, but having done so many of these there's so many acronyms in state government anyway and then you add in these acronyms and all of a sudden <laughs> you know people are listening and going what are you talking about so if there's any questions just throw them out at any point exactly exactly you know where would we be with that without all of our acronyms <laughs> um so so model-based design, like we've been doing this a while, it's not optional, right? And so sometimes I give these presentations to agencies that are coming from a geopack, a uh, legacy geopack. And it's a little bit different conversation with them because there is no model delivery for them. It's always been just a drawing tool. Uh, you, you know, you guys, you guys are coming from a model-based perspective. It's just a little different. Um, as we know, and if you don't know this, you should know that uh, going to open roads or, or going to model-based design is not an option, right? If you if you're if you're um, if you're moving to open roads from any platform, you are definitely going to be delivering a model. But this model is a little bit different than what you've done in inroads or uh, some of the other products in that it's it's more dynamic, it's more integrated, and it's it's a little bit of a paradigm shift about how we approach the modeling, and it it opens up some other opportunity. Um, but also create some other challenges that need to be thought about. As an agency, you 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 kind of need to have a better understanding of how ORD is different, uh, so that you can make good decisions about how to deploy it, so that you get the ROI that you're looking for. And so I, I know you guys have pushed out a workspace, and I and Troy was telling me that you you've basically required ORD be used on future projects at some start date. And I think that that's, that's impressive. There's not a lot of states that have done that. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how that, how that evolves for you guys. But I want to talk a little bit about this concept of getting a return on investment for going to ORD and, and, and uh, see where that takes us. So anybody can get on a call or WebEx and tell you the, the, the generalized benefits of model-based design. You, know, you can get uh, AMG automated machine guidance files out of your your geometry. You can um, you can find issues of usability as we have this. This is definitely a usability problem. Uh, and this, uh, can you can you can I see my cursor, George? Can you see my cursor move on the top right corner? Yes. Okay. So you know when you when you do model based delivery, you you're able to very quickly find usability problems. Down here, you're able to find constructability problems. Um, it, the more detail you put on the modeling, obviously, the uh, the more likely you're going to find conflicts. And I just have no idea what's going on over here. I just posted that, pic posted that picture because I thought it was weird. Um, but there, so there's these generalized ideas of what the benefits of going to model-based design or in going to deeper into model-based design. Um, and that's all fine and dandy. You know, you do... It, if, you, if you're able to reduce risk by doing more modeling, you will get tighter bids. You will have a better construction experience the, the more modeling you do. But it's not quite that simple. 
um, as we found, you know, going going through this process with Florida and Kansas and uh, Utah and other places on these projects, these 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 facts are these these things are true, and we do see benefit in these different areas, and it does have value. But but Grandma was right; like life is full of surprises, and when you try to go to these projects and you try to implement this. Um, what you get as a return on your investment may not be what you initially think it's going to be. And there's a few reasons for that. And a lot of that has to do with how you as an agency decide to approach model-based design and what that, what that evolution is. So um, it's not just about software. You can't just deploy the software and, and magically think you're going to, you're going to get more bang for your buck because if I give you better modeling tools that allow you to do more complete modeling that's more dynamic and slick, that's all fine. But unless I give you some some strategic vision on how to use that stuff and what the workflows are going to be and set expectations as an agency to either internal uh, players or the consultant world, you're going to get a mixed bag. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about what I've seen that look like and then pull George in from time to time here. So if you... If you look historically, particularly in states where you're in road states, both Utah and, and Kentucky are, are legacy in road states, you had folks generating models. I mean, we've doing, been doing model based design to some level for quite a while. But your modeling level, and I've got really, I've got two graphs overlaid here, but it'll make sense in a minute. So I've got this idea of a level of effort here on the left. It, 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 so you've got a high level of effort in your plans preparation and a fairly low level of effort in your modeling. It's just enough modeling so that you can do your plans prep. And you've got a baseline, we'll call that our baseline our return on investment of what you've always been getting out of your modeling and plans preparation. And if you see over here on the right, this is a, a project where you, you may not, this may not be uncommon. You're, you're going to generate the model data where necessary to generate cross sections and other details. And then you're going to fill in those gaps with plans prep. And that's kind of how things have been in the state of the industry for a very, very long time. However, you get this new product called Open Roads, and Bentley tells you it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it's dynamic, it's integrated, and, and it, it, that's all very true. And it, it does allow us to now do things where our sections are not just uh, a drawn representation of a view, but they are actually a 3D slice through your model. So things do, you know, when you update your model, your cross sections update dynamically and all of that other power is built into the software and that's great. But what happens if you deploy that uh, out to a user base? Okay, so they start doing more modeling and there's a couple things here at play. First, they're going to have to do more modeling because the, the software is going to sort of require them to do more modeling to get it into those sections. They can't just go back and draw after the fact to be highly inefficient. And so they start doing more modeling to get their plans done. And, and particularly when you first start rolling this out, you're going to see that there's going to be an increase in effort here. And you may not change what your expectation is for plans because we really haven't gotten far enough for the modeling skills. So your return on investment is actually going to go down because there's going to be more labor happening in the very beginning of that as you do these phased implementations, either on a project by project basis. And this is where the whining and grumbling probably from your consultant world is going to do because we're a bunch of big whiny babies, let's be real. And so we're going to have to start doing more work and still delivering these plans. And so that's where your ROI is going to end up. And as you, as you increase that modeling, if you don't do anything with the amount of plans that you're delivering, your ROI is going to go down because you're literally doing double work. So you're, going to, you're adding more model detail for the hopes of maybe getting some some ancillary benefit from that. But if you keep your the level of plans and information in those plans, you're, you're still doing more work. So your ROI is going to continue to go down. But there's going to come a point where you're going to have a conversation with yourself. And you're going to say, look, we've got these more detailed models and they're much tighter than they were before. And we're having to put more information in them because of the nature of the software has changed. And the contractors just want this data. And if we can just give them that data now and they start to build a trust, then maybe they're going to rely less on those plans because they're not going back and creating their own 3D geometry from our plans like they may have done historically. And so maybe we have a conversation about what in these plans is still relevant. 
and this is happening in other states. You know, George could talk about this in detail, but in Florida, for example, they, they've gone through this effort and found that there were a number of things that had sort of evolved in, our, in the plan sets that, frankly, they came about for something that was needed for like a hot minute, and then they just never took it out of the standard. And it, things that generated, con, you know, hours worth of comments on title sheets and the contractors, when they had the conversation, they just said, well, we just, we peel that sheet off and throw it away because we don't really use that. I mean, I, we thought you guys used that. And they're like, no, we thought you guys used that. And they're like, no. So, so as, as you start to do more of this modeling, you're going to have this opportunity to have this conversation about what, what is still relevant in the plans. And if you can start to do a reduced set of plans and only give the information that's really needed for project delivery, you're going to start to see that ROI change and it's going to start to come back up. And then as you move forward, when you start to have more complete models like you see here with no gaps, then that disparity between what, what you can give in the model and communicate directly to the contractor and what you actually need to say in a traditional plan changes. And that ROI, ROI your return on your investment for changing to this new software is going to continue to improve. And then what you're going to see is at some point, you're going to start to hit a sweet spot where You've got, you've got a group of folks that can do a high level of modeling and they can, and you get the right sort of data attributes and you figure out what parts of that uh, can be replaced either with models and or basic spreadsheets and summary sheets. And your plans prep really comes down. And that's the point at which you really start to see that you you have a much higher return on investment. But it doesn't really stop there. And so this doesn't seem like it's much, right? Like, okay, well, so you, you're telling me I'm going to have to go through all of this just to see this little tiny bump. And the answer is yes in the short term. But really the long-term benefit is where this comes together. And that's that you get to a point where you 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 mature as an, as an agency and your, your new design and delivery standards will mature. And you'll have you'll you'll kind of get it dialed in so that now these things have switched places where you can deliver just the minimum amount of plans in a very tight model. So that when the switch happens, you're going to see that your return on investment is going to land somewhere in the middle here until you start to consider the other factors that come into play. When you have a complete model and you have reduced plans and you've put all of your effort into the design. There's a lot of other things that happen in your design review phase. You know, your design reviews are no longer about this font is wrong and is this the correct line style. The reviews become very focused on the actual design. You get better designs. And I think George can probably speak to that. Our the reviews for our design, our model-based design uh, efforts, they 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 tend to be very focused on actual meaningful design changes and 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 and, and they tend to be a lot briefer. Um, quantities tend to be a lot tighter. We had one project where the difference between us and the contractor we handed it was like a couple cubic feet on earthwork over a mile. So, you know, those things, those things do matter. But if you look at it, you're going to see that it, taken on its face. Yeah, that's where the, that maybe that's where the ROI lands. But when you start to take into consideration other things, like being able to utilize that data to make your asset management system smarter. Um, because you guys, as an agency, have a lot of things you have to keep track of. And if you go to an all digital workflow and you embrace that, there's an enormous amount of potential upside there. The other thing is that you've got um, visualization and communication tools that, that from the get-go need 3D data. And historically, way back here, we do something in a silo and we generate data, often 2D data. We hand that over to somebody who maybe needs to communicate that to a stakeholder and they end up making a completely desperate set of 3d information and a completely different software just for the purpose of communicating something that you had originally designed but when you have this 3d workflow you you can basically take your data and go right to those other applications which you'll see later in the presentation and those things the sum the summation of all of those other things that happen actually move your roi up um, and, and that's when you really start to see the value of going to model-based design. And there's some, there's some, there's some evolution you have to go through here and it is going to be messy. 
every agency that I've talked to has gone through sort of these these different um, <laughs> grief phases <laughs> where they're sort of struggling with the software and they're trying to figure out what workflows make sense for the new software. They're trying to figure out how to communicate about all that to move their user base closer to this 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 other end of the spectrum. So, so what does that mean? Like, if you if you want to move somewhere down that chain, um, it means you have to really think about you have to really think about um, what's the configuration going to be, and and understanding that when you have these, I always like to say, Open Roads is a great program. And the great thing about it is that it's dynamic, it's intelligent, and it's integrated. Uh, the downside to Open Roads is that it's dynamic and it's intelligent and it's integrated. So the problem is that these things were for them to work properly. They need to be they need to be really well thought out in the workspace phase. And there's a lot of additional configuration that needs to be hammered out. And that's an evolutionary process. You know, Utah and Florida and several of the other states are all in sometimes a second or third iteration of their workspaces uh, as their workflows sort of mature and as they move from left to right on that graph. Um, and then once you get that workspace sort of set up, if you don't communicate it well, then you don't get good implementation. So, you know, Utah and others are working on trying to figure out the best way to communicate. Here's how we set up the workspace. And we did it this way for a reason. And that reason is to get an, a desired deliverable out of you. And so here's how our workflows, our workflow is intended to be used. And so that's, that's another area that needs to be addressed. It's another, it's another opportunity for you to or a challenge for you to, to address if you when you start to look at open roads implementations and then there's the conversation around project wise project wise uh both kentucky and utah both have project wise um in in utah uh we've had a mix of the of this projects georgia's project that there was a mix right so some of the projects we worked directly on utah utah dot's uh managed what we worked right off of their project wise server using their managed workspace um, but earlier on when we were still sort of um, clutching our way through it some of the consultants did some of the projects on our own project wise so that we could we could more readily make modifications and changes where we were finding uh holes and then those were later addressed um directly in the utah workspace so there's there's opportunity there to think about how you how you deploy project wise um, whether you have the projects in-house, um, whether you put pilot projects out, see what sort of innovation comes and sort of roll that innovation back into uh, future versions of your workspace. And then there's the 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 advent of the Bentley hosted um, solution, which uh, we will probably come back around in the, pro in the in the question phase, but there are a set of tools that we've used to communicate the model data to the field in the older projects that's now been deprecated and that's called Open Roads Navigator. And a lot of that 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 um, functionality for communicating and reviewing models is being pushed into the cloud. And the easiest way to access that those new Bentley tools is actually by hosting your project in the cloud. Uh, so you still you still manage it as a project wise um, system, but it's it's not living on your server directly. So there's some considerations and things you'll want to think about and, and talk about as an agency in terms of where you want to put projects and how you want to move that forward. And then there's the inevitable standards and documentation changes. In the classic case of this, you know, Florida, uh, Vern tells a story about how when they were going to uh, when they were going back through and they were uh, looking at creating templates and and civil cells and some other things uh, they were sitting down and they were looking at their standard details and they were basically trying to uh, create a set of templates that would allow uh, anyone to to replicate those 3d objects per the detail but as they got into it, they realized that um, it just didn't, it literally didn't work. They couldn't model it. The model wouldn't turn out the way that they had thought it would based on what the standard detail says. So they were very confused by this. So they went back to the contractors and they said, hey, we got the standard detail 
and um, we're trying to model this and we can't get it to work. And the contractors are like, yeah, man, that stuff's never worked. We don't do it that way. Like we just use that as a guideline. We know what you really mean. And so we just go and we just build it the way it's supposed to be built. And that's what we actually do. And we don't really fully use that detail because it's never really worked. So all the time, the designers didn't really realize that because they were coming from a geopack state. So they'd, they'd done details, but no one had ever taken the time to model it. And so there are a number of states that have had to go back and, and based on um, modeling efforts, they've learned that certain things were just handled in the field by good contractors and we never heard about it. And so uh, there was, there was need and opportunity to go back and, and readdress those standards and documentation. Those are things that are inevitable if you want to really move your entire user base forward and get the maximum amount out of, out of the product. And so I want to take a step back here before I move forward to the slides and, and say, George, like, did you, what are your thoughts on that? Like, did I, did I, did I accurately sort of capture sort of some of the evolution with with some of these projects. And I'm gonna apologize, I'm next to Hill Air Force Base and there were F-35 flying over. So if you hear that noise in the background, that's why I can't do anything about that. <laughs> so um, Terry, let me, let me just comment that um, so far the approach has been based on pre-construction. Um, and I, I think the, the approach we took is not really the pre-construction design side, but really the project delivery side. Um, and so as we kind of estimate when we're doing um, a project where we're producing plans that essentially has a model associated with it, somewhere between 40 and 70% of the time and expense is on plan production. Um, and unfortunately, what we found from our contractors is that you know, for a long time before we provided any electronic files, whether it was the model being the legal document or anything else, they were essentially taking those 2D plans and they build their own model. They've got Trimble Business Center, uh, Topcon, AgTech, different things. And, and they're building a model from that paper plan set. So, um, you know, I always joke that it's kind of like that old telephone game where uh, you have a line of people 20 long and someone whispers, uh, uh, a phrase into the person at the end of the line and they whisper it all the way. And then at the end you hear what they thought that phrase was and it's nothing the same. It's the same thing with plans. So our whole approach was not just to design in 3D with new software, it was to try and make it um, a data flow. And so um, with your kind of return on investment, I, th I think the design side, you may see a return on investment, but where the real return is on um, eliminating cutting sheets, because cutting sheets takes forever. And if you have that ability for your design teams to be able to review um, on a tablet or even a desktop and get as much or more information, and then without producing plans, you give that information to both contractors for their modelers, their estimators and their field crews, as well as the DOT field crews, all of a sudden you've taken out a gigantic amount of time that's, that's used in pre-construction. Um, so the other thing I would comment on that graph that you had, Terry, was that um, some people argue that you know, the overall cost of a project, um, the pre-construction is typically going to be anywhere between, it depends on the type of project, but it can be five to 15% of the total project cost. Well, your return on investment based on pre-construction may not be as, as, uh, as advantageous as the overall construction, because if you're finding issues that may come up in construction, those are gonna be way more costly than your pre-construction cost anyway. So we found that having a better model um, and putting a little more time and expense into that modeling is going to potentially keep something from happening in construction, which is gonna cost way more than the pre-construction cost. So as far as this baseline goes, I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of validity to this. The only thing I would put is that we've kind of delineated between plans and cutting sheets. So is it an electronic plan or is it cutting sheets? So we still have to put out quantities. 
um, and, and those are still in Excel. And we're still we're trying to get away from that as well. But if we can just deliver the model, all of a sudden um, we're reducing the overall cost to the project substantially. Um, so I appreciate that what you've gone is kind of looked at the design software, but at least for us, it's it's more of the whole process from design to construction. I don't just mean contractors or field crews, it's both, and then back. And I think ultimately that return on investment becomes um, significant. Yeah. You just may not see it in pre-construction as the reality. Right. And yeah, and I, you, you can definitely get into this range and that you brought up a good point, which I should have probably considered and we'll add to this for future president, which is that the idea that you know, if you catch something if you catch something in design that otherwise would have went as a change order, that that could be staggeringly large. And that's hard to to always know. But yeah, there's I mean, we've had examples on the on the pilot projects where things were caught early because we had a model. Um Yeah, and I would and say how, some of those things that were caught, um and just so everyone knows, this has been a huge evolution from 2016 till now. And so, you know, trying to review a model in 2016 was was tough because there weren't really any tools except for designers. So you bring in maintenance or construction and trying to walk through a model was a struggle. Um, we used Open Roads Navigator and it was successful to some degree, but it, it just was never meant for that. A lot of people complained that it was too hard to use, which was absolutely true, especially for review. But, you know, the tools have evolved. And so now you can go into a review session. And um, we did it with iTwin on a project about, I want to say, three or four months ago. And the people from maintenance were able to do it with very little training. It was about a half an hour's worth. And so they were they were happy to be able to look at that. When they can look at the model and see kind of that, what it's going to look like and zoom in on something and make a comment, it's just way more useful than a plan production review. I mean, you're you're looking at stuff and finding it. And they're some of the ones who are finding, like Terry said, I mean, we've, we've been able to um, avoid having costly turnovers or excuse me, change orders because of that. And so this this um this shift towards readdressing what makes sense for plans is not unique to Utah. Um, uh, Florida DOT has a what they're referring to as next gen or nine hundred series plans, and we're in that process of having that discussion about each and every sheet. They're they're looking at actually a large format twenty four by thirty six. Kind of take it. I joke that we're going back old school, right? <laughs> like computing is going back to to a client server mainframe style approach and our plans are, are getting bigger again and having less data on them. But we're able to do that because we're able to share so much more, so much more. directly with the model. Somebody just came on and, came on and now I'm getting feedback. I'm getting the feedback too. Great. not talking, please go ahead. Okay. okay. Chris, Chris, can you please mute yourself? Chris, there we go. Okay, problem Hi. solved. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, no. Chris, you're unmuted again. Oh, he's raised his hand. What does that mean? Whoops. Oh, well. Okay, there we go. So, um, yeah, so... I, I kind of took a pause there because I wanted to make sure that I got George's uh, George's take on that, and I knew he'd have a slightly different bend, so that's good. Um, I guess moving forward, and I'll let George speak to this as well, but my 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 take on this is that it, you guys have deployed Open Roads Designer, and it now lends itself to a lot of other opportunities to really um, streamline and do a lot more than you've been able to do with your 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 legacy model based approach. But to do that, you, you need to have a strategic vision. The states that I've seen be most successful with getting the most bang for their buck are the ones that from the top understood that there was value in having a strategic vision forward with how they what they wanted out of that product and what they what their expectation was long term. Utah being one of the earliest. Um, 
having good messaging around that you you've got to have a vision that you, you and you have got to clearly communicate that i mean this this idea with model based design was communicated directly by the director um carlos has been very serious about that and george can certainly speak to that um and then having pilot projects and partners that you you don't eat an elephant all at once and you don't get to this in game with model based delivery all at once. It, it's got to be a little bit of an evolutionary process. And there's some pain and suffering, and you're going to need a crying towel, and that's okay. Um, but understanding that you can do this in, in pieces if you're strategic, you have pilot projects that test different pieces of it. That's the way to move forward, and 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 that that invites in a consultant community that gets buy in from them. You're going to be able to leverage their knowledge and skills to help you better better approach this long term and then thinking about how you're going to roll this out in stages which is really part of your vision um i, I put in alternative contracting methods because uh, i wanted george to mention that a little bit we didn't we did this early on we did this in a little bit different way with the early projects because we wanted input direct input and communication between contractors and designers and so george and his folks uh, looked at different ways of doing that. So, George, do you want to talk a little bit about those pilot projects and how that's progressed for you? Yeah, and and so even going back before that, with I think mm -hmm. your your bullet points are really um, spot on. The strategic vision is probably the the most important part of this whole thing. And um, I, for me, I feel like we're super lucky in Utah because uh, Terry mentioned uh, Carlos, and before Carlos was John Nord, and and there not just um, lip service with innovation, it, it is an expectation. And when I say that, um, he routinely says, if you're not making mistakes, you're not being innovative enough. But then he follows it up with, okay, but we don't want crazy mistakes. You know, don't go out on, you know, our, our busiest interstate is uh, I-15. He's like, don't go and try a pilot project on I-15 during rush hour, that doesn't make sense. Um, so they're pushing it from the top, and, and at the time, our project development director had gone to Ashdo in 2014, and this was the discussion about the model being the legal contract plan, and he brought it back and said, hey, we should move in this direction because, you know, data flow is going to be the, the next generation of how things are managed. So um, that messaging came, and we made the goal that we wanted the model to be the legal document. But the reason being, what we wanted to do was take the data from design, pass it to construction, get an as-built back in a data format and populate a, I, I, I always call it an existing condition database. Digital twin is probably the, the buzzword now, but basically just a, a data system where anyone can go in and get information about any piece, excuse me, of, uh, your system at any time. So we started small. I, I think a lot of DOTs have, have kind of looked and said, okay, if we have got a $100 million uh, project, how, how are we going to make this work? And so it, instead of doing that, we, we started in exactly the opposite. We, we, we decided to do a pilot project with a small rural passing lane, um, and it's actually in the mountains, uh, it's a $3 million construction project. And um, frankly, we probably could do that project without even putting plans out because the contractors would be able to do it that easily. But talking about alternative contracting, we we did that. We use a method called CMGC. I think it's called CMAR sometimes, where a contractor comes in on the pre-construction side and, and looks at risks to mitigate them so they don't show up in construction. This project essentially had no risk except the model being the legal document. Um, and so, you know, Terry said to get information, we clearly wanted information, but we also wanted to find out what those risks were of making those files available to the contractor and the contractor using the model as the legal document. So the contractor has a model, which was Trimble Business Center, and we had a model. At the time, it was SS4. It was not ORD. And um, we made the Bentley model the legal document. So, you know, we kind of said, do whatever you want to do. We don't care. But ultimately, we're going to check grade points. 
and we're going to check all of the civil features back to the Bentley model, knowing that our contractors can't read Bentley projects. They, they just can't read those models. None of them have the expertise. They would use Civil 3D, but ultimately they're going to use Trimble Business Center, um, an ag tech, a Topcon, maybe Leica or something like that. And so we were trying to figure out what's the best way for us to get that information. So our pilot project was a little dinky project, um, but it showed us what we needed to do in order to make files available to contractors. Um, uh, like Terry said, I don't know if it's the same project you were talking about, Terry, but on this project, I think we were, um, I want to say 40,000 cubic yards of dirt, and we came out within one yard of the contractor's Trimble model and our model. And, and our whole strategic um, uh, look at this and our, our, the way that we were going to approach this was to say, let's start small not knowing if we were going to have issues and and if we did it would be okay let's learn from it and and try again and go back and do the same small project cmgc and figure out what we need to do and with that the whole thought was okay if we when we do have success we move on to a bigger project cmgc but then go to bid build and 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 use that same methodology of small project just a passing lane we didn't really have any utilities or any right of way, it's straightforward project, and apply those principles while increasing the complexity on a CMGC to move forward. Again, we're going back to 2016 and 2017 when the tools were a struggle, to say the very least. And I don't want to turn this into Bentley bashing, but when we rolled out when we rolled out SS, when we rolled out SS4, we we had major major pro problems and we did it on big projects and this was not the model's legal document that was just using the software and it was it was a disaster to say the least um they rolled it out with issues and the same thing happened with ORD it rolled it out it had issues we didn't have the major problems but we had pretty bad problems with ORD too but nevertheless as this moved forward um, we did have success on that CMGC and we're able to move forward to a design bid build on a similar, you know, just a, a rehab project. Um, and, and we went to I-80 and did a similar project, but it did have utilities and did its CMGC. And again, the risk was the model being the legal document. The risk wasn't necessarily where we saw major project risks where we want to have a contractor in pre-construction. So, one of the things we realized early on was the contractors were going to be probably the major entity that we needed to have a relationship with. And so we went to AGC, um, AGC offered four or five contractors that would come to, we, we've got a, we call it our MBDC committee. It's now digital delivery of MBDC, but it consists of consultant designers, internal designers, some of our internal construction folks and now contractors. And, you know, I, I have to admit, I was both happy and surprised that two or three of the contractors stood up in one of the meetings and said, hey, if this is gonna move forward, we can't sit on our hands and pretend like we're not gonna have a competitive advantage if we don't do stuff. And they were the ones who started driving it. Um, and I would say it wasn't quite two years ago, it was a year and a half ago, it was in February, we had a, we had a, a, a workshop and we invited federal highways, we invited our consultants, our internal folks, contractors. We also invited a, a, a group of industry leaders, um, Autodesk, Bluebeam, Bentley, um, RDV, OnStation, there's probably six or seven and, and they all came too. And I guess the message I'm saying here is, if we had tried to do this alone and just push it out, I, I don't think we would have had success. But bringing in those partners and, and letting them help us and help them guide what needed to go was a gigantic reason why we've been able to move forward. We've gotten such good input from our consultants, from our contractors, from our vendors, and, and we're now at a point where 
I mean, we're essentially using mobile devices and rovers and not putting plans out. And we're seeing, you know, the ROI is not in pre-construction. Um, we may see it a little bit, but on our, on our construction, we're seeing our projects come in under engineer's estimate. And we're seeing the use of the digital tools become, um, it's the, the only complaint I'm hearing now is our field crews said, okay, we've tried out all these different tools. Can we just go to one tool? So they're not saying, let's go back to plans. They're saying, give us a tool that we can use and let's not pilot so many of, of the new tools coming out. So I, I, th I think the only message I'm trying to give here, and I realize I went on for about 35 minutes, but um, <laughs> is it, it, it's not just pre-construction. It's, it's the whole group and, and it's a, concerted effort to kind of move forward and starting small at least in 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 our experience is the way to go because if, if you have an issue on a small project it's not going to be the end of the world especially if it's um you know somewhere where you're not going to impact traffic you're not going to impact um, different things we looked at it as hey if we had worst case scenario what would happen and we thought worst case scenario was the contractor having an issue with our um, construction crew and walking off the job. That seemed to be the worst case scenario. We felt like the project could maybe, maybe a disaster, but we wouldn't be impacting the public by virtue of the way the project would shut down. And it never came, that never happened, but we, you know, approached it with that worst case scenario. So, so that was a lot, and I, I guess I want to get a sense. I got I want to get a sense of what you guys are thinking about because you, you obviously invited us to make a presentation and talk about some of our experience and and thoughts on this nationally. Do you have questions? Is there is there things you're wondering about? You're an interesting point. You have you have an opportunity to go to this new product and maybe get a lot more return on that investment. That you're having to make regardless it, what were your thoughts on that yep i have a question real quick this is kevin um can you all touch george or, or terry uh, kind of touch on um what happens after construction have you all started looking at how this integrates into asset management because that was part of your graph and it's definitely a part of return on investment just just kind of curious what your um what your insight is into that part of it as well so Utah and George will definitely speak to this as well, but we, they've spent an enormous amount of time looking at different ways to get at that nugget, right? There's a lot of upside potential there. What's the, especially in a state where you're moving to almost exclusively models, what happens, what does your asset management system look like when you no longer have plans that are maintenance office, but you only have models? How do you address that uh, in terms of workflow and communication? And then um, the use case for models for asset management and the things that need to be attributed there are different than both design and construction. The, we're, we're, it's still a fairly fluid and highly evolutionary, and they're looking at different ways of getting that data from one system to another, their system being GIS, um, because that's where it's historically been. So they've got some really, really savvy GIS folks at Utah DOT, and they've been using uh, FME and some other engines to do conversions and see about bringing data over. We've talked about uh, iTwin. We've talked about a lot of different things. I, um, I'm I'm not completely plugged into all of those conversations. Only about half of them. So maybe George could speak to that a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. So Kevin, you asked a great question that. Um... There's, there's only an hour left, so I can talk about this forever. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stay at a super high level and just say, we used a company that drove our, our entire road system to, to give a mobile point cloud of the entire above ground system. Um, and then we had each individual asset extracted and, and sort of geolocated with, with, with attributes. That's essentially a snapshot of a digital twin of our system. 
And so what we've done is we've said, hey, we can write layers on that. We, we can take information and write layers on it. But it's unfortunately, it, it's got a complication. That means we've got to get the information from the design. We've got to take that and make sure that it was constructed that way. And then we can take that information and write a new layer in this um, database. So that's kind of the approach we've taken. And, and Terry threw out FME, it's a tool that extracts information from CAD and, and allows GIS to kind of convert it. And so we were awarded a federal aid grant. And with that grant, what we've been doing is in the workspace, we have focused almost exclusively on signs, striping, guardrail, and barrier. Um, and with that, what we've done is um, with the individual striping line styles, the individual bearing lines, uh, barrier line styles, guardrail line styles, we have, I want to say, somewhere between 100 and 200 individual line styles that show attributes with what the area is, what the height is, what the skip, it's got all the information, and we're passing that to our traffic and safety so that they will have that information in the future. So that's kind of our first stab at having this, I don't know the right word to use, existing condition database. So um, the reason we're using GIS is because the tools are pretty user friendly. We've already used GIS in, in that system I was talking about. And we've found that our inspectors in the field can use this tool and, and have the ability to take that information and populate an asset database. Um, so like I said, I, I, I hate to say, I could probably go on about this for hours, but that's the high level look at it. Any other questions? Yeah. I have more, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna hog it. So does anybody else have a question they wanna ask before me? They're either all muted or they don't have questions. <laughs> <laughs> they're afraid they're going to get a buzzing sound. Yeah. Well, let's ask another question then. This is something that that's, we struggled with ourselves. George, and you can definitely talk about it, and Terry, if you've experienced it in other states. Um, like you said before, a lot of times this it gets pushed from the project development side, but realistically, I mean, this is this is bringing everybody together. So looking at the construction side, field inspection, did you all have any issues that you had to overcome to get people on board, get people trained, uh, you know, get them the skill set to be able to switch from the traditional paper method to digital. And absolutely. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. And so um, let, let's, let's just face it. We're in an engineer's world and engineers don't like change. I mean, you know, if you've got a process that works, why in the world would you ever try something different? And so, you know, that exists in the Utah DOT too. And so there's definitely people who are like, you know, we're never gonna get rid of plans. I don't know why we're doing this. This makes no sense. And so realistically, what we did was on our pilot projects, we handpicked teams that we knew would want to, you know, they understood the vision and they would want to make it work. So we brought our construction crews knowing those individuals that would wanna take new technology and make it work. Um, and as that moved forward, it's almost, um, you know, those even that don't want to do it, they see everyone else and, and it almost becomes conversation, meaning, you know, whether it's at the water cooler when, when we didn't used to wear masks and stuff um, <laughs> and, and stuff like that, where uh, someone's talking about a project that they were on and how much more efficient it was and how much easier it was. and so yeah, Kevin, there's definitely that issue, but it almost takes those that have done it and, and not just doing it because they're showing other people because they think it's cool, but because it actually saves time and it is a, a better way to do it. Those that were reluctant to come on at first, they see the value and, and they want to come on. So that's not across the board. There's always going to be those old salties like me that don't want to look at this stuff. But, um, you know, early on, 
there was only a handful of people that wanted to try this. And there was a lot of people saying, I don't know why we're doing it. This doesn't make sense. But a year later, after the success of those projects, those were the people that are like, oh, well, okay, we want to be involved in this. And as it's evolved, um, yeah, you're, you're always going to have the group that's going to struggle. But I, I think as pilots, you have to hand select those that um, will want to make it work. Yeah, and I think that you you know it's over time when people start to see it for themselves, then they then they, they may not get it at first, especially if it if it's going to require them to change. I, I once worked on a project in the '90s that was using legacy inroads. It was just over a billion dollars in work. It was a huge project and. We were doing complete model-based design then, and it was a concrete job. And so we had to have grade sheets with labels every 10 feet on, on grid. It was just a stupid amount of labels. It was a quarter million dollars in sheet work just for labels for this concrete. And my manager fought me and fought me. He's like, why, why are you and this other person, why are you spending so much time on this model and the design and making it perfect? But we had a complete model and we modeled every single joint line. And then we used some scripting to allow us to basically do dynamic labeling and so we were able to create a process that relied on that model that allowed us to literally press a button and generate all of the labels with the proper orientation for that in about 60 seconds that's how long it took to process and yeah we spent a lot more time on the model and we if, if you counterbalance that yeah we did burn some more time there but we ended up still saving a quarter million dollars on that one task and after that happened, we didn't get a lot of pushback on why we were spending so much time on the model, because in addition to that, there were a number of things that we would have not otherwise discovered related to utilities uh, and, and just whether we were next to some very large old buildings that, as it turns out, and potholing had some weird foundational things that were we wouldn't have known had we not modeled everything and did the, did the extra work. So long story short, you know, after you do this with a few projects, people start to on the sidelines start to stand there and go, oh, well, maybe this is a good idea after all. So sometimes they just need to see it. Yeah, and, and Terry, the other thing I would throw in on that is, you know, a lot of times it's not going to be the designers who are going to push back on this because, you know, designers want a model. But I think where you see the issues are with new products like ORD, you know, we, we struggled with it when it came out because it had issues and, and that makes our designers frustrated. And they're like, why are we, you know, why are we going to this product? It doesn't work. Well, I mean, that's a good point. And so there's kind of a combination of, and it's not just design software, you know, it's the software to do reviews, software in the fields, the apps, contractors, but from a design standpoint, when you've got a product that's slower, um, that has issues, that's where you see the frustration on the design side. Yeah. Like I said, make sure you have a crime towel handy because Open Roads has still got problems. <laughs> but with that said, I mean, it's been out now, what, three, four years, something like that? It's getting and better. It is, and we lean on them as hard as we possibly can. Um, and we, you know, show them exactly some of the problems and they're responsive. It's just that it, you know, it's a big ship they've got and making changes does not come overnight. Uh, other I'll second that based on our uh, experience with ORD in Kentucky, I mean, it's, I made a comment to Rachel on a text message. It's kind of like jamming a square peg into a round hole. You know, we're trying to make it do what we've always done and it's not really built for that, but we're spending an extraordinary amount of time, you know, to create plans. So I'll echo what you guys are saying. If you keep pushing in that direction then that return on investment will flip on you. Very, very, very nice to see that graph. I really appreciate that, Terry. I might steal that from you actually. <laughs> So, Absolutely. Anybody else have any questions out there? Come on, guys. If not, we'll cut everybody loose and then we'll get into the software. Yeah, so there's so the things we have up next really sort of highlight some of the ancillary use cases for the model that add to that ROI 
beyond all the other things, capturing potential errors and emissions and giving you just a much better product. Once you once you have that model, there's so many other things you can do with it. And so the guys have got some stuff they want to show you that I think you'll find interesting um, and, and might might create some other conversation. So with that, I'm going to hand I'm going to hand the reins over. To John, John, hey, yeah, okay. Hey, John, before you get started, I don't know if people are going are leaving or not. I'm going to um, in the chat. I'm going to put a URL to our digital delivery site. It's got a whole bunch of resources for design, construction, tools. It's got all of our pilot projects with the information associated with it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken now, you can even go on that map and go down and click on assets and it will show the information on it. So um, I just put it in the chat and um, Kevin or John or anyone else, if you think there's some value in sending it through email on the appointment, I can do that too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, George, so much for doing that and for jumping on this today. I think everybody, including myself, learned something and was uh, very good. We appreciate your time. Um, bef before you or and everybody jumps off, though, I wanted to tag on something that Terry and George ha said. Sometimes there are returns on investment in this pro process of project development that aren't easily monetized. Um, and we found, and, and this is why we wanted to present some things in the second hour, we found that one of those areas is a right-of-way discussions and, and to a lesser degree public involvement, but definitely um, right-of-way discussions. When you go to show major stakeholders what you plan to do with their interchange to their airport or their medical center, for example, it becomes a matter of economics for them. And so you have to be very clear not everybody reads plans the same way, and we found that um, moving the schedule up, right away schedule up six months by um, just having more efficient discussions through Tennessee Department of Transportation really benefits the project. And I, I would be happy to share some of that with you later. And in fact, we're going to hit on a little bit of that in the second hour, which is why we've done this. So. Um, at this point, if you want to stick around for another at 50 minutes or so, we, 50 minutes or so, we are going to happily go through this, some of these things. If you need to jump off, uh, we understand. It's the silence. So here we go. Um, the first thing that I think we wanted to, to describe here was to take a a step back in the project development process and talk about Open Roads Concept Station. Now, this is early on in project development. This is uh, this is before you would get into the ORD or inroads and start laying out your alignments. Why why do we want to do this? Well, first, Kevin asked us to, and what Kevin wants, Kevin's going to get. <laughs> but second, well, sure, we've done this stuff in Tennessee and we've talked about the return on investment, but they're vols. We wanted to <laughs> we want to show you that this is possible to do in Kentucky, and it doesn't require us to have some some fancy contract. If you need help with it as KYTC leadership or um, just any project that you're working on in one of the districts that's hit a, a wall, feel free to reach out to us, to Troy, to Tyler, to me, to Terry, and and get some help. We don't mind. We we're in the transportation business. We want to help you move these things forward, which is why we want to talk about some of these things here. So what is Concept Station? It, it's a Bentley product. It's unrelated to MicroStation and inroads. It's used early on in the project development. You may even say the planning phase um, to develop concepts. How it works is you, you simply use the software to download some existing terrain and there are there's a way in the, within the software to do that you don't have to jump out in and out of the software to do these things it's all within the software you download s some existing terrain stream some aerials uh, the software will generate your texture your terrain for you you lay out some concepts in horizontal and vertical along your corridor using design criteria such as design speed, minimum radius, super elevation, all those things are taken into um, effect. Then you apply your typical section or 
what we call the roadway template. And then you see what you've got in 3D, just like you see here on this main screen. That That is concept station dumped into LuminRT, but that's concept station. It's in 3D. From that, you can revise on the fly based on impacts or costs, and your costs are quantified within the software as well. I'm going to get up to all of these things in more detail as we go. This, lastly, then you can publish it to LuminRT and make up a, a pretty picture like this if you are so inclined. This is a view of concept station. This is just a screen cap, and what I hope to do is jump out of this. Um, but as we've alluded to in some of our earlier non-Bentley bashing, sometimes it crashes. Um, they're working on some stuff. But I wanted to take some screen caps to show you in case I jump into the software and it fails on me. This is a corridor in Boone County on our uh, Mineola Donaldson project um, near the CVG airport. This is the Mineola Pike, and you can see in the top is the corridor. Below that is the profile, and you'll notice there, if you're into design, you see some K values and some Ls in the vertical. So to get that, you sketch them in by hand. You um, then apply your design criteria, and just like you would in any design job. It's just much, much faster. And the top view there, the corridor, um, applies those changes on the fly. You can see to the top right some of my design very basic design criteria, um, urban principle arterial for Mineola, the design speed, the the road template, which is a three lane, uh, three lane twiddle, and then it it just uh, populates in 3D. Here's another example. This is in Jefferson County. This is the this is the concept we were working on for the. Six, I-64, I-265 interchange. This is the, one of our early alternatives we called the turbine. It laid it out in concept station first just to see if it would work. Um, it was. It looks like a lot of work. It's all in 3D. It's all quantified. The clearances, the bridges, they're all there. And it took about eight hours to do that from start to finish. So how do we do it? I, I don't want to get into a lot of detail because, again, you can reach out to me or Troy or any of us anytime. Um, but I wanted to give you a high level. You use the geo coordination geo coordination services to pull in your either your uh, USGS terrain. You can uh, import you uh, KYTC lidar if you need to, or you can drone fly it. Now I'm gonna give you a warning on a couple of these. Sometimes you go to download the USGS data and it's just not quite adequate. You may want to pull in some um, some LIDAR from the statewide LIDAR. If you've got a large corridor though, it can be too a little too dense. And if you've got a highly detailed corridor, you, LIDAR may not even be enough. So you can drone it, process that through context capture, which Tyler's going to talk about here in a minute, generate a 3SM and do ground extraction. That That's a workflow that works pretty well for this. Um, so more on that later. Here's an example of US-60 through Bardstown. This is Concept Station shown with a drone flight, 3SM. It's uh, an example of the third bullet there that um, I was just talking about. I think this one turned out pretty nicely, and it's a widening application, so it was a little more difficult than your typical green fields, but it worked out pretty well. We got um, some great detail on some historic buildings with the drone flight. Um, back to horizontal. So uh, I think there's a little bit of a misnomer when you use concept, concept station that it's just very high level. Well, it is in a way, but you're still using engineering design criteria to do these things. There you can see my radius of 733 or uh, Mineola, you can take that radius, change it on the fly, and, and your um, model populates as you make that change. And here's an example of one of my templates for Mineola. On the left, you have a retaining wall, sidewalk, curb and gutter. This is a five lane, actually, and then sidewalk on the right. And um, you can see here that you put your widths and pavement depths and your materials. So those are used to calculate your quantities at the at, at the end and compare alternatives. <clears throat> Here's that same typical section in 3D just so you can see what's going on. And if you're paying attention, you'll notice that my two sidewalks left and right are HMA. That's actually right. Um, that's one of the options we wanted to look at to reduce some costs. 
Now, I've said a lot of things about costs. This is what that looks like here. When you are done with your corridor and you're happy with your your cut and fill, your limits, your horizontal and vertical, your site distance, things that you can check in concept station, publish it out. And um, you can see here that you get your typical roadway things. This is a fill job. Um, so we've got some concrete, sidewalk, yada, yada, all the way down through here. You can see your, your quantities. The important thing is, though, that your unit costs are calibrated. And in order to really check this thing, because I don't trust software that, that much, I actually ran a concept station model of our existing alternative that we did, not existing, our, one of our current alternatives that we had already done using inroads, <clears throat> legacy inroads. We had the costs all done the traditional way. I laid it out in concept station in order to check and see. And it, um, and, and yeah, John, run through um, the typical estimator software that KYTC uses. I took that cost and compared it to the cost in concept station. I had to do a little calibrations on uh, some lump sum items like um, MOB, DMOB, traffic control, things like that. But the pavement was shockingly close. So what I did was I just saved that corridor and pushed a new template through it, a three lane, which is um, the very first thing I showed you populated new costs, and in about 15 minutes, I saw that the four, the five lane went from 4 million down when you reduced it to three lane, 2.9, as you can see here. And we had those that cost comparison on the exact same alignment with some three lane modifications in, like I said, 15 minutes. So it's very, very popular software. Um, how am I doing on time? I think I'm doing okay. What I wanna do here is briefly try to do a live demo where I always make fun of Bentley guys when they do this because it because when it's not canned it wants to crash <laughs> okay so I'm gonna pick uh just a, an approach road or even an entrance and I'm just I'm not gonna get too fancy here I just want to show you that when you draw a road here's my three lane corridor and I'm gonna tie this entrance in and I want to know if this is even gonna work So here's the profile gray line of my entrance. You can see as I move my mouse, it's moving a white line along the profile. And that actually looks pretty good. It looks like I should be able to tie this in um, pretty nicely, but I wanna move this on up, get a little bit closer, insert a vertical PI like this. Let's give them a nice commercial curve, vertical curve. In the future, we'll lower that sidewalk down. I'm not worried about that right now. And it looks like I should be able to tie this in earlier, a lot earlier, actually. So I know that that driveway is going to work. And if I wanted to go to even more detail here, just so that it looks decent, um, I could, I'll do that real quick to show you. There it is. Now you can swap this template out with a concrete, whatever you want to do. This is just a demonstration to, to show you what I got now. Now that I've made the intersection, it resolved the grading. So this is exactly the same grading as the mainline corridor now. And you can see that everything ties in pretty good. You could come back here and see where you really needed to tie it in, chop that down and eliminate some quantities, and then boom, go on to the next one conceptually. And I know that this driveway will work with this vertical and I'll let the, the detailed design work itself out in, um, joint inspection or even PLNG if this is pre-PLNG concept review. And speaking of that, we did do that for the, this is again, Mineola in Boone County. We did do a concept review and um, because of some funding issues of the project, we're looking at a few cost saving measures. And this is one of them. So we think it's got a lot of uses. Um, furthermore, you could dump this alignment if you're happy with it into uh, MicroStation and progress with your full detail design if you needed to. Jump out of this. I think that KYTC really could find a lot of benefit of concept station. However, there are a couple of limitations that I've run across. Troy and I and Tyler have run across here recently. Um, it's not great in winding applications. Um, it, it 
has a tendency to cover up with the proposed template the what you're trying to widen against i found a way to trick that to trick to trick it um reach out to me if you need some help with that it needs a little work and i've been in touch with bentley about that to make a a widening template and aaron what was your question that you can adjust the radius um yes you can adjust the radius of the intersection turning movements the, the curb returns i assume you mean yeah you can adjust those after you place the intersection um depending on what your design vehicle is uh cost breakouts if you want to break out a cost by a corridor alignment say you want your driveways to be to be separate from your mainline corridor it's not great at that it just lumps everything together so you would have to do a save as delete your mainline corridor and refresh your quantities not that big of a deal but it's a little annoying if you're trying to to break them out which i know um we like to do here in kentucky importing lidar does work i've done it but it's really slow if if you have a even a mid-sized project corridor size i've um, got pretty poor performance i prefer to use the gs um, coordination services um, and by the way those are all to state plane and to scale the striping is difficult to show accurately it's a little it's just a little wonky because it's all based on the template so if you've got a lot of lane shifting going on it's not going to really show that it's it's not made for that that's a little more detailed than this was meant to be um, if you want to make revisions to intersections and ramp gourds after you've tied everything together you're going to have to delete all that and and then make your revisions it does not like once it resolves grading between intersections like i showed you does not like to make those changes after the fact um, you it is cool that you can convert uh, export this to microstation and then export that to google earth to share with anybody works really well i've got a video on um, vimeo on that but google earth doesn't honor the clip so if you're in an excavation portion of your job google earth tends to just cover up your proposed and there's really nothing i can do about that bentley says that it's a, a google earth problem and they may be right but they say that about everything <laughs> so um and then aaron asks what what length of corridor i've done some pretty long ones i've never run into anything that was too long um, we laid out the Bardstown bypass connector. It seemed to do just fine. I even went back and tried to lay out the I-75 connector. It did okay. Every time you make a change, though, it's kind of like ORD. you got to be ready to wait a few minutes for it. Um, so the next, step, the next step in the process would be to uh, generate some existing through context capture. And Tyler's going to talk about that, but I want to make sure that I that I hit on the usefulness of context capture in our industry. It's as important, <clears throat> to me, it's as important as good survey. Your existing context is absolutely fundamental because once you, you don't really realize the benefits of the things we're talking about if you don't have the, if you don't have the existing context. And we've done this several times now. We've um, had, We've wet many crying towels through this process, let me assure you. Context capture does not always work as advertised. But thankfully, Troy and Tyler were here to help me get it figured out. And once it's working, it's really, really nice. And again, reach out to us if you have specifics about that. For now, I'm going to turn it over to Tyler. All right. Thank you, John. <clears throat> so like John said, see the Bentley context capture is really going to focus in on the building the existing conditions uh, to a pretty high detail level uh, so really you know what is it it's it's Bentley's reality modeling program you uh, give it imagery and it helps you to build a, uh, a, a reality mesh or, or some sort of um, you you know you can build a train out of it or a reality mesh or there, there's there's plenty of options in there. Um, I believe it's you know probably most relatable relatable to Pix 4D, which I believe there are several cabinet members um, who are familiar with that. I've seen a couple of uh, uses uh, flying some areas with drones um, and taking that imagery, putting it into Pix 4D and you know you can quickly get as as they found, you can get some some pretty detailed uh, terrains relatively easily just depending on the size um, 
So the the main difference we found so far with context capture and Pix4D is uh, context capture is in the Bentley world, so it's 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 made to directly import into, uh, like John said, you can take it back into Concept Station. Uh, you can bring it into Open Roads. Uh, well, pretty much anything Bentley does. So how does it how does it work? What's the workflow kind of look like? I said you you basically you give it some images and it helps you to build a reality mesh. So uh, one nice thing with with context capture, it's a, it's a very scalable process. So kind of once you get a little used to it, you can do anything from, you know, if you want to look at a, a, you know, curve correction or bridge replacement or all the way up to the, the example on the right is, is uh, six and a half miles of highway that we had flown with a fixed wing. On the left would be an example of what a flight plan for a drone would look like. So it context capture, it treats it the same. You just have to know what kind of cameras you're working with and you get some geospatial data. And, and most cameras these days, whether it's on a drone or on a fixed wing, um, you're going to be able to get that data and tie it into context capture pretty easily. Tyler, would you care if I interrupt you just for a second? Right, the, what Tyler's showing here on the right is the flight plan of the fixed wing, uh, which took the camera down the project corridor. The reason um, the software is doing, or the reason we have a flight plan to do that is because the soft, the whole purpose of the software is to convert digital imagery into the reality mesh by stitching these photos together. And it's nothing fancy. It's just any digital camera, as long as you know the sensor size and a few other key aspects of the camera and you have proper overlap between the photos, the software will generate the reality mesh from any digital photo. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. So you need the, the focal length, the sensor size, and the height of the camera. That Those three factors will allow you to use photogrammetry to determine the, the horizontal vertical location of a given pixel for every image that then gets stitched together. One thing I wanted to mention is that it, it does the same thing as Pix4D. The one major difference between the between uh, context capture and Pix4D is the ability to generate scalable mesh data. So Pix4D is really great if you've got a parking lot or a building or something of a, a smaller size. But when you get to wide areas where you need to do like you've done on the right over here, the scalable 3SM format is far superior. That's when the context capture makes more sense. Okay, back to you, Ted. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Yeah, so, um, you know, hitting on the scalability again, on, on the left, you, you're flying with a drone. You're usually working with just one camera. And so the images usually have data attached to it in the drone. And on the right, with you know, the larger project, it was a fixed wing that had a nine camera apparatus mount on the bottom. And so one option with context capture is you can then capture that data for each camera and into a block import, that's what it's called. And you can import all of that data that uh, uh, Terry was kind of uh, hinting on into context capture uh, for each image. And it all just depends on what kind of detail you're looking to get and really, you know, what the project really needs and what kind of, um, what kind of scale you're looking at. So this is the 3SM. John was mentioning about the Bardstown widening area. This is what it looks like in context capture, or uh, yeah, context capture. Uh, just kind of navigating around that mesh. Uh, you can see there's prisms kind of showing where the images were taken from. Uh, our drone pilot in the office flew it with a Phantom 3. And just to kind of give you an idea of the detail I believe this was probably like one one day's worth of flight. So one hour, one hour, yeah, one hour's worth. So again, scalability you can do. You can go out and in one day, if you live close to the area or you work close to the area, you can go out with a drone, take some images, throw it into context capture, and within one day, get some fairly accurate terrain data. Uh, or the the example from Tennessee, six and a half miles. I mean that that did take several weeks, but it was you know much more complicated in a larger 
larger area. So what you do with, I mean, what do I do with a 3SM? I mean, I mean, directly you can take it into concept station, like John mentioned, or through the reality mesh attachment, you can bring it directly into ORD and start integrating it with your proposed model. Now, kind of what we always, what we've mentioned too is, you know, it's not, it's not a perfect process and we've definitely had some learning curves along the way, but um, you know, when it, when it start when it's really working, it, it, it's a really nice product. Um, you know, some lessons we learned, there's the speed of technology is going to be, you know, faster than the speed of highway projects mostly. So anytime we've come into this with a new project, Bentley's upgraded a lot of things or the cameras we're working with are on a whole new level. Um, and really, you got to know what you you know, the technology and the equipment, but you got to know the project too. So the existing context, the if, if you got to know where water is or trees, shadows, I'll kind of show you what I mean about that. We, uh, we went down to Weisenberger Road Bridge with some District 7 folks a couple months ago to kind of fly the area. We took, uh, if we took two hours out there with a couple of drones, flew it, and within a couple hours, got this model, and the mill looks really nice, and this rock wall looks really good, and then we, you know, the whole focus of the project was the bridge that was replaced, and um, at this point, I didn't know if I should just delete it and say the drone crashed and not tell John anything, or, you know, <laughs> um, you know, so some things we learned there is, the, the, there's a lot of water moving. The backdrop was trees that were blowing in the wind, and context capture didn't really like that very well. So you know, you kind of you really got to know the the area you're working with and what kind of project you want to apply it to. So, and talking about scalability, here's you know really the imagery we plugged into that six and a half mile project. They were. 36 megapixel cameras, 50,000 images. It was, you know, we were passing around hard drives and graphics cards along the office or, you know, really what we're getting to more now is trying to get the, in one day turnaround, try to get some existing information that we can start designing against or create some very efficient visuals um, with, with the drone applications. It's just another screenshot of the, this, part of the scale, that's about half of that project down in Tennessee. So to sum it up, I mean, context capture, it, it really is a, is a great product to help us get our existing context in high detail. Um, in the first hour, you know, Terry and George, they discussed how we get the proposed conditions developed through model-based design. And uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Troy and he's going to discuss how to pull those two together. Okay. Um, trying to trying to get there. Can someone confirm that you can hear me and see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Cool. So I'm going to talk about Bentley Lumen RT. Um, it's kind of the next step in the process. So the concept station was um, kind of lateral. Um, it's not really, I mean, it is model-based design, but um, the uh, the context capture is a way that you can get existing, and so you could design against that, so it can be part of your model-based design stuff too. But then Lumen RT is after you've done all the work uh, that Terry and George talked about, and you've made the investment in uh, designing in 3D, you can get some really powerful stuff out of Lumen RT pretty, pretty quickly. So Lumen RT is a visualization rendering program. It's part of Bentley Suite. So um, what that means is you put the existing and proposed in there, and then it can give you still images. So that's what you see there. Um, you can get videos out of it, which I'll show you in a minute. You can do virtual reality. So this is at a public meeting. Um, you, if you know me, you can see me there in a suit, and no one had died, so it was a red letter day. Um, but this guy has the goggles on, and this is like an example of what he would be seeing in the goggles, and his dad was watching him navigate on the project. So we were able to take a virtual reality uh, environment to the public meeting and let people look at the project in virtual reality. Another thing you can get out of it is called Photosphere, which is kind of a lower tech version of that. So this is like a 3D panorama that you could put in a pair of Oculus goggles, 
and pass those around at a public meeting or, or a design team meeting or something. And so this would look like as you put the goggles on and you turn your head, you would be looking at different parts of this picture and uh, the goggles would stitch that together for you. Um, so LuminarT, it's really user friendly and it integrates with the Bentley products really well. Um, so, and, and the other thing is that it's real-time rendering. So it used to be that if you wanted to do a rendering and get a pretty picture, you would assign a bunch of uh, values to variables and stuff, I guess, in the rendering software and send it to multiple computers and the CPUs would all render that. And then when you got done with it, you would see if it looked good or not. And you kind of had to be an expert at that to be able to do it. Um, but with uh, real-time rendering, it's using the graphics processor on your machine. And so you're actually seeing what it's going to look like in real time. And so you can make adjustments to it there. So it's uh, it's pretty powerful and easy to use. Um, that's also one of the weaknesses, though, because as you, as you probably know, like when someone makes a product for you and they think they know exactly how you want to use it and they make it really easy for you to use it in that way, sometimes it's harder to do other things that they didn't intend for you to do with it. So uh, one example of that would be that you can't really get your camera path out of Lumen RT. Um, like if you wanted to get it back in the microstation to see where your camera was for some reason. Um, once you get to Lumen RT, you're, that's kind of where you live. You import things into it and you do things inside of Lumen RT, but you don't really pass it to another piece of software. Uh, and it and it does have some crashes and bugs, but uh, Bentley has uh, worked with us a lot on getting some of the ones that we found fixed. And so I think it's continued to improve. So a quick workflow, um, you could get into Lumen RT by doing what John did in Concept Station by getting existing in Concept Station and then doing your proposed design and then hitting the button. I think the button actually says visualize and it takes you to Lumen RT and you're done. Uh, the other example, I'm going to jump to the third bullet point, would be if you just got in MicroStation and draped an aerial on a terrain and then put your uh, proposed model in there, you could send that directly to Lumen. Um, but what we've been doing and what we're showing here is we're doing the existing in-context capture, and then we're doing our proposed in inroads, and then in MicroStation, we cut out a hole around the exterior of the proposed and then send the, cons, uh, the context capture existing data and the inroads data out to LuminRT. So you can also get traffic animation out of MicroStation, and then you just hit the go button and it sends it to LuminRT. So that was all pretty boring. So possible uses, this is where it gets more exciting. This is a picture of our video at a public meeting. Um, it's a really good communica communication tool for stakeholders. One of the things that we've uh, thought it might be useful for um, would be like a right-of-way negotiation. So this is uh, just an example of what you could do. You could put like a fence or something around a right-of-way parcel and then shade out a prism that would show the area of taking or something so that you could communicate with a property owner uh, what the actual impact was going to be. And then I think Terry's actually done, been involved in, you know, what him and George have talked about is uh, doing design reviews in 3D. And I think uh, at one point, Terry was using LuminRT to, to uh, log some comments and stuff. Yep, absolutely. In fact, we found that in many cases, we would we would discover things that the reviewers maybe didn't catch in some of the other applications just because the the physics of where real-time rendering engine takes care of all of the hard bits with lighting and things like that. It just makes it a lot easier to see. In fact, you can play with the shading and purposely throw, uh, throw shadows and look for uh, gaps and overlaps and things that just kind of pop right out at you that otherwise are difficult to spot. So yeah, it's 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 quite helpful as a review tool. So I'm not as brave as John. So this is just a canned, uh, sped up video of the import into Lumen. Sometimes Lumen can take a long time to import. Um, but this is what it would look like if you if you this is our job uh, in Tennessee, and so you can see the existing in the background. It's actually a, uh, not our flight, it's, I think that, that existing is actually from Concept Station. So I've sort of got three layers here. I've got a proposed and existing, uh, and then an existing from Concept Station. So here I'm just gonna show how to add a car. So the cars that you're seeing come on here are 
cars from MicroStation. And so you can kind of just like populate a bunch of cars going, but sometimes if you're making a video, you want a specific vehicle to get to a specific point at a, at a certain time. And so you can just drop one car in Lumen. You can also script lanes of traffic in Lumen too. But so I'm just gonna add this vehicle and then there he's moving, but he's going too slow. So I'm gonna speed him up. And if you'll notice in some of the variables here, you can have a beginning time, a start after, a repeat after. And so you can have this car get to the point in your video right when the camera gets there. So it's pretty easy to, the hardest part is keeping track of what cars you've assigned, what values to, that kind of thing. They also have all this uh, vegetation you can add. So if you need a cactus or some corn or something, you can get that. I was stuck with a white oak tree here. And it's just going to find, you can plant the trees on existing or proposed. So wherever you snap to, it's going to snap to the ground. You can see a bunch of trees in the background where I've done that to mask uh, the difference in elevation between our design and the top of the tree canopy because uh, context capture gets you kind of a mesh of the top of the tree canopy, but you don't get the ground if you have leaves on the trees when you take it. So I've kind of masked that hole. You can see that you I was changing the seasons. Um, I should note that this is in a uh, lower quality because I'm working because it would really bog down if I was in full quality. You'll see what it looks like here in a minute, but um, you can change the time, change the cloud cover, all that kind of stuff. So it's a uh, pretty customizable and, and pretty easy to use. It's, uh, you know, for even for somebody that doesn't do this kind of thing, I just do engineering and it was something that I could learn to do. And the way that you do a camera path is you just take two different pictures and you tell it a time between them and it interpolates the camera path. So you tell it, I want to be at this point at this time and this point at the next time, and it'll fly the camera between those two points. And so it takes some getting used to, to keep things in focus as you're moving, but it's really easy to create a camera path and then to get a video out. So here's a, an example of a, so this, you'll see like our logos in the bottom. I did that in Camtasia, but everything you see here is going to be, um, this is just a little clip for something we're doing for TDOT. And so the, this would be a good time to mention too, that we didn't have good 3D design. We were given some 3D design and some DGM files, I think, and PDFs of the plans. And so we ended up rebuilding a lot of this. Uh, uh, proposed work that you see and so i guess TDOT, Troy, let me let me clarify that because t dot we were doing the design on the southern sections they wanted to do it for this one we didn't have the design and we were so we were just given a basically a pdf set of plans yeah, it made it sound like that we didn't do what we were selling yeah. um but we're not uh, selling it we're just yeah but what <laughs> what i'm saying is uh yeah when another consultant had done it and TDOT later decided they wanted a visualization done. And so we had to come back and rebuild in 3D a lot of that stuff. So yeah, thanks for thanks for saying that. So that's what you would get out of Lumen. And um, that might take uh, you might you might be getting 10 frames a minute or something, and there's 30 frames a second in a video. And so, you know, it can take several hours. A lot of these I end up running overnight um, to get the whole video out. So what you're going to see now, and I'm going to let, when this gets done, Tyler's going to take back over and talk about, just briefly about uh, Adobe After Effects, which is a post-production software, um, which isn't real engineering and isn't Bentley, but it really takes this kind of public involvement thing to the next level. And so, um, but the specifically, Troy, what this was, this was used for was mostly the UT Medical Center um, because they were bogged down and right away. Um, which is a form of public involvement, you're right. So, so, but the point I guess that we're trying to get across here is that if you, uh, if you're doing your design in 3D and at the, you know, near the beginning of the project, you decide you need good aerial coverage and you have them take photos that match the concept or the context capture requirements, then, you know, when you get downstream of all that, you've got all this data that you can put together, something like this. And, so I think, I think it turned out really good, and I think Tyler's done a pretty good job of uh, figuring out how to do this stuff. So I think it's cool.
so that's uh, I guess that's what I've got. And then uh, whenever this little video gets done playing, Tyler, if you want to jump in and explain this for a minute. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just go ahead and take it there. Okay. All right. So After Effects, like Troy said, it is not part of Bentley, uh, but it's it's just kind of one of the options we've kind of uh, found we could integrate. It's really just kind of the cherry on the top for us of this process. Uh, so, you know, in After Effects, it's it's built, you know, it's used to build visual effects, motion graphics. Uh, it's really used in uh, it's uh, production studios for movies, TV, the almighty YouTube influencer. So, you know, really how in the world could an engineer or state agency integrate this? And we found it's it's uh, been pretty effective in communicating with stakeholders. Uh, we could also use these, we've uh, used them before for public meetings um, and really any kind of communication outside of the project team. So, you know, to kind of put this into context a little bit, you know, how do engineers typically or a state agency typically distribute project information? And a lot of the times it's really come in, the, in a 2D form, a still frame image, or you, you plot out some plans or some kind of uh, simple visual. And, and I mean, it's really, that's just been the cost effective way to communicate outside of the project team. You, you go to a meeting and it's role plots or plan sets you've colorized either digitally or, you know, maybe even just colored pencil, uh, the right away agents taking plans or PDF on a tablet into the field. Uh, if you really get on the high end of T 2D, you can take a photo and Photoshop a rendering on top. But if you've already constructed your, you know, this virtual world during your design process, you can implement After Effects or a similar software and it can really take over with all that detail and you can easily be adding in all of these these you know labels travel paths any anything that somebody outside of the project team um, or i mean even within but mostly we've been using it to communicate outside of the project team would want, would want to see so this is kind of behind the curtain a little bit sped up I definitely don't work that fast uh, you know who who knows the design the best and generally it's the project team or you know whoever's developed it and worked on it so you know b before we could build uh, visualizations or animations you would um, you know hire an animator or you know some somebody who knows this kind of software and you could send them they can build an existing terrain for you you'd send them your proposed model they could stitch it together and what you get is a rendered out video. And what that leads to is if it's not quite right or you want to see something different or you get a little further in the process and you need to see extra detail, uh, it's, it leads to back and forth. So, you know, like I said before, if you've already got your virtual world built in Bentley, then you can, it, like Troy mentioned with Lumen, you, you can be the one to kind of go in make your tweaks for what you need to see and on the fly, uh, you know, generate whatever visual you, you kind of need to communicate. So the, you know, another bonus of After Effects is once you kind of learn, you know, how to work into it, you can, you can really combine it and make a nice polished product. You can do little animations or you, know, you can go in and build build a map animation so you can really kind of bridge who you're trying to communicate. You know, they're familiar with maps or what they see on Google Maps on their phone. You add little animations for what the project's going to look like. You can then transition that into an aerial image so they can kind of get a feel for their existing terrain. And then if you've integrated context, context capture, you can then take them into you know, your, de your detailed 3D model of the existing. And then finally, you put your proposed model on top of that. So you can kind of take whatever the user, whatever you think the user um, needs to see or whoever you're trying to communicate with, you know, this, this really just kind of gives you an extra layer of tools to 
to communicate with them. Um, you know, like John said before, you know, everybody's going to read planes differently. This is just a, you know, really a more visual way that if you've already built your 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 virtual world with the existing and the per, um, model based design, uh, and you've already got that as just as part of your standard um, project method, then you can kind of start to, you know, it doesn't have to be After Effects. There's other programs out there, but, you know, you, you can kind of take that wherever you need to go with it. And that's all I've got on After Effects. So I think what we're saying here is we've done a few things to embrace model-based design. We personally have not done model-based delivery, but Terry and George have lots of experience on that. Um, and I think if if there's anything here that sparks your interest that you want to know more about my main point throughout this whole thing is please don't hesitate to ask we we would love to help um in any way we can and and that i don't know exactly what that looks like maybe that's just help um a district or come alongside somebody that's already some other consultants under contract whatever that looks like just don't don't hesitate to ask let's let's talk it out there's some things that we've learned that you may be able to use especially with context capture and and um asset manage or uh data management one thing i'm going to do here though if you can see my screen can you guys see my screen yes tyler can you see yeah yep this is uh christy brown's email address um she wanted me to put this up here for um, KYTC leadership. If you have any questions, you wanted to cut us out of the loop and get the real answer from the owner, I would, if I were you, please give her a, an email and ask some, ask her some of the ways that they've been able to use the 3D model-based design in the right-of-way phase and how that's helped them with the public meetings and some of the major stakeholders along this massive corridor such as the airport, UT Medical Center, UT Research, UT Ag Research, and Industrial Park. I mean, it just goes on and on. Um, and so jot that down. You may you may want to give her an email. She, she'd be happy to go back and forth with you on some of these topics. Um, so we've got as long as you want to stick around to answer some questions. So I think Terry's got to go ahead and jump off. If yeah. you've got any questions you. specifically for Terry. Now the time. I also yeah. am going to have yeah. to leave here in a couple of minutes. <laughs> I was just going to say really quickly for um, um, Kentucky, if you ever want to have um, a conference call, a video call, um, we can bring in some of our leadership. If you want to lessons learned, just let me know. Kevin, reach out and we can do something. Or if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Um, and like I said, Kevin, if you think there's some value in emailing the group that URL, let me know and I'll do that too. Okay, Thank I've got you, that bookmarked. I've I've looked at that page quite a bit, George. Appreciate that, and I'll send it out to anybody that doesn't already have it. So, okay, sounds good, George. I'll be on the other awesome, call, guys, and we can. <laughs> okay, hey, thanks, George. All right, appreciate thanks, you guys. It. Does anybody have any other questions, George, for but... any of us? Did you all look at Aaron had submitted a question about computing hardware for the. Concept station, Lumen RT, and that sort of thing. Um, did you guys answer that? Maybe I didn't hear it. I didn't see that. Um, so I don't know. I can start with Lumen RT. Um, you need a, a good graphics card for Lumen RT. Um, I think I think my card is like twelve gigabyte card, maybe. Maybe right. maybe so, be sixteen. So if twelve so in the. But you can't use PowerPoint. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really think that might be what broke it. It was, yeah. it was, it was something around the same time. So, so both LuminRT and Concept uh, Context Capture uh, are heavy heavy users of the GPU or the graphics card, right? So, historically, Bentley products have eschewed using any sort of graphics resources, and they mostly run on the CPU, like Genos and all. That's all CPU based processing. But with some of these new prod, prod products like the real-time rendering, you need a GPU. And for doing all the heavy uh, double precision math that's needed to take those images and turn them into stitch 3D meshes, you need a, a GPU to do it. It's the only way to really do it. So 
uh, both, uh, well, with concept, with context capture, those are generally designed to be more server-based applications. You could run them on a high-performance desktop, but you might have better use if you're going to do it on mass by just having a server run it and just remote to that server. Uh, but they have an application that will grade your machine. Basically, you can install it on your, if you, like I had a laptop, and the first thing I did is install context capture. I ran the application that ships with the product, and it ran a series of tests and told me um, how my how my graphics card was going to perform and if it would even work. Um, so, so yes, uh, graphics cards do matter uh, with these applications, and they, it is a little bit different spec than just what you would need for an RD. So that's a consideration. Broad terms, I would say at least eight gigs on your graphics card, and the higher speed you can get, the better. Um, if you're doing something large like this, you're gonna want 12 gigs, and um, we even Troy even struggled with that. But the prices of them are coming a lot, coming down a lot. So, other questions? Anything related to ORD or modeling or anything like that? Well, we got Terry the genius. Oh, oh boy, now it's getting deep. <laughs> I heard the beep, I thought Terry just left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually do have to punch off. I got I got to go to George's meeting uh, in 60 seconds. So. If you guys need anything else, um, Kevin's got my email. You guys can always reach out to me. Uh, I'm currently in the mountain time zone. Um, I may be in the Pacific time zone in a month or so, but yeah, you can always find me online. Okay, thanks, Tim. We're thanks, gonna sir. we're gonna email some stuff to you, Kevin, to email out some contacts. Um, if you don't mind, just to email those to your group, um, and we'll send you some of these links too. If it looks like something you want to pursue, that you'll have that information. Yeah, perfect. We'll do. Yeah, hey Kevin, this is Phil. I just I did want to point out too. Uh, you know, a lot of the videos that we were showing today didn't. They're not that smooth uh, when you're showing them over a WebEx. So uh, I think John can also send some links to some of those uh, videos on YouTube. They're they're a lot smoother and easier to follow. So. Oh yeah, I was gonna say if we could get some YouTube video, that would be great. Oh yeah, sure. That's a perfect way to do it. Yeah. So we have trouble sharing large files anyway, so the raw video wouldn't be that good. But if you got YouTube links, perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Hey, there's there's another else. question from Aaron. Aaron won't speak up, damn it, but he's got a good <laughs> question there about plan production with ORD. Have you guys uh, mastered that yet? No, we haven't here in Lexington. Um, that's quite the issue, though. T darn, Terry just just dropped off. Um, we've got some some folks though in Florida who have had a lot more experience with it. Um, I don't actually have you guys has KYTC led a project fully in ORD since the design memo came out. Uh, Patrick did one, I think, didn't they? Patrick, did that actually go to letting, or even just a contract with a? Consultant or something like that. We Sorry. have a few contract. Yeah, um, I don't. It may have been pulled, Kevin. Yeah, it, it was done. What first of last year, middle of last year, finished up. So, yeah, it made it through the whole yeah, process. Sure. It just, I don't think it actually got wet. Tyler and I have done a bunch of playing around with it, but we we don't have an active con contract in ORD to, to, to do plans. Okay, we've got a few consultant projects at this point that are using it, um, and then a few in-house as well, but Patrick's was the first one to be done. I'd say there may be a few more coming on by the end of the year. I think Erica um, has one that we're at joint inspection stage, so she's got some plans out of it, but that's just, it's just a, a pain and we were hoping somebody could shed some light on it maybe, but you know, we're finding that plans with Bentley are an absolute afterthought and 
Yeah, that's we're what we think, a, too. It seems like we're having a Terry might have shed the light on it with his comment about doing less of them, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got a real rough set right now of joint inspection plans that I'm going through, so. So tell me how you needs is a typical section in a general summary. So. Yeah, quantities. <laughs> but there's no construction guys on, is there? <laughs> <laughs> on your plan sheets with your text, did you end up doing all your text in each individual sheet in a separate model space? How'd you do your like your construction I notes? The, I did the notes in the. In the drawing model. Okay. And then um, I did all the other, like all the other text in in an Excel spreadsheet. So construction notes and um, what like what other text in Excel? Um, like uh, like ditch charts and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good idea. It. Yeah, kind of like uh, Troy did some of them like a long time ago. Yeah, that gives me a lot of heartburn because if those things crash all the time and you lose all your notes. So yeah. that's a good idea, Back, keep them backed up. Okay, uh, anybody have anything else? If not, we like you to reach out to us anytime. If you need anything, it's uh, no big deal. Okay. Anybody else? Guess not. We appreciate Thanks, everybody. Guys. Good information.